Hello everybody, my name is Mark, or Pixel Rain, as you may know me, and today we're going to be getting into the meat and potatoes of the simple voxel system we're working on here. Today we'll be implementing the actual shader that will handle all of our rendering. It is fairly basic right now, handling normals and lighting, but I'm not going to ramble for too much longer. Let's go ahead and get into it. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create a new folder to house our shaders. And then we're going to go ahead and create a subfolder called includes. And we're going to be making two different shaders here. Both are going to be standard surface. And as a reminder, this project is a universal render pipeline project. So this will not work under the standard render pipeline within Unity. Outside of Unity, I'm sure this very same thing would work, but it might require some additional tweaking. So the first includes we're going to make is going to be called functions, and I'll be renaming these within VS Code here in a second. The second is going to be called shading, and then we're also going to make a shader in the root shaders folder called ray intersect svo and then we'll go ahead and open up the functions and let me rename these before i forget functions.hlsl and shading.hlsl functions as you may be able to tell by the name is just a collection of utility functions that I use. So from the top we have the GPU node struct. This is just the compute shader version of our GPU node that we made in the last part. It has a float through position, a float half, a child index, and a voxel data field to represent our linearized node. Then we have a SVO buffer that is of type structured buffer and that's just what we assign that linearized octree to. Then we have object world position and that represents the transform dot position of our object within the unity world. Then we have another struct that represents the bounds of a voxel cell and that's used with this function down here, get node bounds. And I believe we covered this in the last video as well. This is just a simplistic implementation to calculate the min bounds, max bounds, and center for any given node based on its half size, which again would be comparable to the extents. And then we also have the is position within node bounds, which is another simplified check where we grab the bounds for a node via that get node bounds, and then we just return a Boolean all for if the position is within the set of min and max. Then we also have a compute shader implementation for determine child index. And again, this just offsets that index depending on where the position is relative to the current node's position. So this just helps us recurse down into the correct node. We have a extremely simple helper function here that could actually be reduced just down to a single line, but if the child index is negative one, we're hitting a leaf node, whether there's data in it or not, there is nothing to recurse further. And finally, we have find child index, and that will look through the linearized doc tree for the node closest to our position, and that'll use the determine child index that was previously defined, and we'll iterate down through the doc tree to try to find the node in question. Returning a negative one if nothing was found as that is our bailout. Moving on to the shading. This is a much simpler script and I absolutely use ChatGPT for this approximate mate normals function which is why it has GPT appended to the end of it but we're going to pretend that didn't happen and I'll explain it as we go through it. The first function we have here is called decode color and that just does the inverse bitwise operations to get the ID of our voxel in question, so 0, 1, and so on. And then it'll use that ID to index into another structured buffer of voxel colors and that will be assigned from the voxel settings, voxel colors that we set up in the last video. We also have a float3 that represents our light position within the world space. And as you can see at the bottom of decode color here, 
there is a debug where it'll just return red if the voxel data is invalid. Getting into the approximate normals GPT function, we start by getting the bounds for whatever node we're looking at. We grab the cell center, which is not particularly necessary given that we have the cell center within that node, but GPT. So, you know, the local position, which takes in our hit position from our array and subtracts the cell center from that. Then we have the extents, which is pretty much just going to be a vectorized version of our half size within that node. We start with a default normal pointing to the Z axis and a max distance of negative one as the entire goal here is to find the closest face to the camera. And then we're going to iterate over all three axes and compare whether the hit position is closer to the minimum extents or the maximum extents. And then we'll configure the normal based off of that. If it's the max extents that it's closer to, then the normal will be considered positive. Otherwise it will be considered negative. And we also keep a cache of that max distance to ensure that we're calculating the correct face here. Then we return the normalized normal that's calculated inverted here. And then we have our shade voxel function, which takes in a voxel node, a position and the ray direction. And that will get the color from the voxel data. It'll calculate the normal using the above function. Then we'll go ahead and grab a normalized difference between the light position in world space and our current nodes position. And then we'll calculate the dot product of our normal and light direction and take the max of that and zero. And we'll multiply our color by that dot product to give us our diffuse lighting. And we'll return that with an alpha of one. This is where we would determine if the voxel is transparent or not. But again, we haven't gotten there yet, so no big deal. Moving on, we'll get into the ray intersect shader itself. Now we'll go ahead and move up here to the top and we've got some access code here that I'll just pull out like we don't need a main text or a max distance with the way everything works. So at the top here we include a core package or I guess a core includes from the universal render pipeline that handles a lot of our initialization to make this shader actually legible. And then we include our shading.hls file that we just went over and that in turn includes functions.hlso. Then we've got our variings and attributes struct that are passed into the vert pass and the fragment pass respectively. Our varyings contains a position, a hit point, and a ray origin point. And then we also define a struct called candidate just like we have on the C sharp version of the code. Then our vert pass simply takes our varyings that we're going to be outputting. Then we transform our object position from the object to H clip, which I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not a hundred percent sure what is the style shader is not normally my cup of tea. I'm used to compute shaders. Then we also get our unity object to world space position and our vert position here. And we calculate that as the hit point of our visuals. And then we also have our ray origin, which is our world space camera position, which is a universal variable. It's not going to be defined anywhere in functions or shading. As we had on the CPU side, we also have our ray box intersect, again, courtesy of ChatGPT. There were a couple different methods I tried prior to getting to this one. Most of them worked very similarly. This one just cleaned up and adapted to my code a little bit better. And again, this is just going to be calculating our rough distance and whether we're hitting within the bounds of a node. I'm not gonna get too far into this because we did already cover it on the C sharp side. So not too big of a deal there. Then we have another function called linear to depth and this allows us to actually have depth mapping within the cube so if you recall in the first video i had a little physics demo where you were jumping around 
without taking the depth into account, it would be like the shader we're working on is transparent and we certainly don't want that. And what this does is it takes the linear depth passed in by the Raybox intersect GPT later down and it multiplies that across with the world value of the Z buffer params, which is another global variable here. And then it's using the inverse of that and dividing that by the linear depth by the Z buffer params Z property and then returns that back out. Getting into the frag here, we have a constant max candidates of 16 and that's just because we have to initialize a full buffer to use when iterating through the linear octree. We go ahead and set our out depth variable here which writes to that Z and we set that to zero and then we start just like on the CPU again, with the root node at index zero. If there's, for whatever reason, voxel data at node zero or it's defaulted out because zero is gonna be the default for an integer value on the CPU, we return a debug color of blue with a very, very transparent alpha on it. Then we set up a couple variables like distance traveled, our ray origin, which comes from our varyings. We have a ray direction, which is going to be the equivalent of what vertice point or, you know, object point within the object we're looking at, minus our ray origin. Then our root position that is going to be used recursively takes in our object world position and our root position, which is almost always going to be zero, but better to calculate that in now in case the octree is offset like you're building multiple objects and you just have them offset by root position it'll take that into account as well then we go ahead and calculate the node bounds for our root and after doing some early out checking here with a ray box intersect that checks against root and essentially all this is going to do is go hey, this ray isn't intersecting against this root bounding box, we're not drawing anything. So this eliminates most of our calculations that would be happening. There's not actually that many points where the camera's intersecting with the object unless you're inside of it, in which case there's realistically probably only a few nodes visible at that point anyway. Then we go ahead and estimate our start distance using that distance output from the ray box intersect to get as close to the edge of the root as possible along our ray direction. And this functions almost identically to the way it did on the CPU. Since we already covered this, I'm not gonna get too far in depth in it again and lose myself in my explanation. The only real difference between the C sharp version and the shader version that I'm going to go over here is just in what happens when we find an actual node. The first thing we do is set our output depth that again goes straight to that Z buffer to our linear to depth calculation based off the distance to the node that we're hitting. And then we return the color calculated in that shade voxel function that we went over previously. And then finally, we get down to our shader definition which is very important we have a few tags here we have a alpha test queue render type opaque and then we also have a few flags here specifically alpha to map and call off which disables any backface calling so you can actually have your camera inside of the object. And that wraps it up for the shader. Like I said in the last video most of this is very similar to what we do on the CPU that was all already copied over, so you already knew how it worked. It's just a matter of having it written out on the GP. And then we have one other thing that we want to do before we jump back in to our project and get that all set up. I'm just going to pop back into our voxel container script, and, and we're going to add some code to our update function and move our initialized buffers from in awake down to below this pre-init that happens or we add some test data on start and that just makes sure we're initializing our compute buffers after the fact. With the update code it shouldn't matter but it's better to have things in the correct order anyway. So what happens here in update is if the ray marching material property is not null it'll go ahead and initialize the buffers if it hasn't already with this is initialized pass that we have down in the initialize buffers call. 
And then if our scene light property is set, it assigns the light position world space to our world space light objects position. And then it also sets the object world position based off our current transform position. With that taken care of, we can go ahead and finish up our configuration here. So we'll go ahead and make a new folder called materials and we'll go ahead and create a new material called ray intersect we'll assign that from custom ray intersect svo we'll go over to our voxel container object and we'll go ahead and drag the material into the ray marching material property and the light into the property as well then we want to just make sure our container is scaled appropriately so 16 by 16 by 16 matches our voxel objects extents of 8 by 8 by 8 and then we'll go ahead and save that enable our mesh renderer because this all bounces through that to function and now if we hit play you can see we have a shaded and actively rendering version of our little voxel scene here. You can even go through and remove various things. See, yep, I was able to click through the gizmo and then when you stop because of that function that duplicates the voxel object that we went over in the last video, you can make runtime changes without worrying about your actual object being destroyed. So that's all I have for you guys today. The next video is going to be broken up into multiple parts. For instance, we're going to go over the simple physics solution I have. I'm also going to show you guys how to set up a procedural generation system using this. It's not the most optimized at the moment. I will be working on that in the interim. And then the other thing is I am working on dynamic updates to this. So if you break, say, the second block up from a static object or a static cell within like a tree, the rest of the tree will topple. But that's all in the future. If you want to see any of that and you're excited or you like this project, definitely feel free to like and subscribe. Come join the Discord if you have any questions or you just want to hang out. And I will see you guys in the next video.